Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar from the Society for Implementation Science and Nutrition. My name is Isabelle Michaud Letourneau, and I'm the senior technical lead working with CISIN on several projects, including the Implementation Science Initiative, which will be discussed today in today's webinar. So first of all, I would like to acknowledge that the Implementation Science Initiative has been developed by CISIN in collaboration with the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation, or 3IE, thanks to a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So we're very grateful for this collaboration and support. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. You may send in your questions at any time, and we'll, I will pose as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. If you have any technical issue, please also type your questions in the question box. So first, as you can see the plan, um, I will start with a quick introduction and we will quickly move into the three parts of our webinar today, which will be presented by three different speakers. We'll present an introduction to um, the hybrid design, a little bit more about the context and, and more specifically about the implementation research that is taking place in Uganda. Um, so before I introduce the first speaker, now I've, I've done the introduction, I'll move quickly as a reminder for some of you who may have attended the webinar in April 2019, we have presented the six component of the Implementation Science Initiative. Um, we had talked more about the bottleneck assessment and the bottleneck inventory. So today we're going to focus more specifically about the implementation research that is taking place in Uganda. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Curran. Dr. Curran is a medical sociologist. He is professor of pharmacy practice and psychiatry at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. His broad research area has been health services research with focus areas in mental health, substance use disorders, and diffusion of innovation in a variety of healthcare settings. For the past 15 years and more, he has developed and tested a range of facilitation and other implementation strategies designed to support the uptake and sustainment of evidence-based practice. Dr. Curran is the director of the Center for Implementation Research in the University of Arkansas for Medical Science, which is devoted to train the next generation of implementation science uh, scientists, among others. Um, so Dr. Curran is one of the pioneers of the effectiveness implementation hybrid design that we will be talking today. So we're very honored that he has agreed to speak to us today about this innovative approach. Thank you so much, Dr. Curran. The floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you for, for that. So my task today is just to give um, a brief overview of um, these hybrid designs. Um, I have a slide here which shows you um, a, a screenshot of the original hybrid design paper, um, which sort of has all of the formal definitions, uh, rationale, um, many examples, um, and if you have uh, more interest um, you know, in these, I recommend that you seek this out. Um, so first I would, I'd like to just sort of cover, you know, what are these things that, that we are calling hybrid designs? Um, the essential point that we're trying to make here is um, uh, these designs blend research questions about um, some clinical uh, or prevention, intervention, innovation program, um, along with research questions about how best to support uptake of, of, of that intervention. And some of these studies focus more on the effectiveness of the clinical intervention, um, and we will call those hybrid type one. And then others focus more on testing competing strategies to support the uptake of this intervention. And we will call those more hybrid type three designs. And then others look more equally at, at these clinical effectiveness and uptake 
support questions equally, and we call those more hybrid type two. Um, so why hybrid designs? Um, um, in our original paper, uh, the main reason that we thought that these might be helpful is that we could hopefully speed the translation process. Um, the, really, the, 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 the whole impetus behind implementation science is to try to get what we know works in, into routine practice fact, uh, faster. And we were realizing that part of the way that we do this research is actually helping to slow this down. So we were trying to propose some designs which might help us move faster and that it might not be necessary to wait for perfect effectiveness or, or you know, slam, slam and dunk effectiveness data on some clinical intervention before moving in to looking at implementation research questions that we could, for lack of a better term, backfill effectiveness data while we are developing and testing uptake strategies. And also maybe on a larger scientific question, which I think is certainly salient maybe for more fields and more, more content areas than others. Um, asking the question, how do clinical out, out, outcomes relate to levels of adoption um, and fidelity of the delivery of that intervention? And how are we going to know this relationship if we don't have data from both, from both sides? Um, when I teach on hybrid designs and really sort of DNI science, um, you know, uh, for newer folks, I often find it helpful to use some very simple, simple language. Um, I often call the intervention, the clinical practice, the innovation, um, the thing, and uh, and and in sort of lay language, effectiveness research looks at whether the thing works, whether it changes clinical outcomes, patient level symptoms. Um, in implementation research, we, we look at how best to help people and places to do the thing, to deliver the intervention with fidelity um, and to all the people that should get it. The <laughs> implementation strategies are our interventions, are the stuff that we do in lay language to try to help those people and places to do the thing. And the main outcomes in this kind of research um, are how much and how well that these people and places are doing the thing. So the primary outcomes, especially in hybrid type threes, have, have to do with the quality and the extent of delivery. Um, so in our original paper and in some of our follow-ups, we have presented and continue to talk about these three hybrid types, as I've indicated. Hybrid type one, largely focused on um, testing the, uh, the effectiveness of some clinical or prevention intervention, often a traditional randomized trial um, at the patient level, but with some process evaluation of uptake, preparing for future real real world delivery. Hybrid type three focused um, usually in a comparative way, comparing strategies on how best to support uptake of something. And then hybrid type two, um, a, a, a sort of dual, more equally focused approach. And for many of these designs, there's dual randomization. There's a patient level randomized trial nested in a cluster randomized trial of competing implementation strategies. Um, here's, a, here's a couple of different ways to sort of view the same idea as, as a seesaw or, 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 a, or, or a teeter-totter. Um, hybrid type one leaning much more towards testing of the thing um, hybrid type two, having a more balanced approach in the, um, you know, more 
equally. And then hybrid type three, much more focused on uh, tests of how best to support the, the uptake uh, and fidelity of the intervention or how, how best to do the thing. Um, here's a few examples um, of some hybrid type three, which is our, you know, focus for my my next few minutes. Um, uh, there are others out there too. Um, these are very very helpful. Um, most are our protocol papers, you know, which really show the the nuts and bolts, you know, of how to design these in varying ways. Um, so a, 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 a little more information here on hybrid type three designs. Um, again, largely focused um, on often a trial of competing imp implementation strategies. Um, when there is randomization, which is, which is common, um, it's usually at the level of the, the provider <clears throat> A clinic, a healthcare system, some location uh, where the intervention or program will 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 be delivered. <clears throat> Clinical outcomes; these patient level symptoms, functioning outcomes are secondary. <clears throat> Why would you consider these? Well, there, there's a. a a, a number of reasons why hybrid designs might, you know, be a good choice. It's fairly common, especially in, in some larger healthcare care systems, to proceed with a focus on studying how best to support uptake with, with, without completing, a, you know, sort of a full range, a full collection of randomized control trials of effectiveness studies. Um, in some of our uh, U.S. healthcare systems, um, in the Department of Veterans Affairs and, um, and, and others, we actually see this fairly frequently, that there are mandates to roll out to try to get everybody to do a certain intervention, a certain practice, a certain guideline when there really wasn't um, hugely great effectiveness data. <clears throat> so using these kinds of designs can, you know, learn how best to support uptake while also collecting some of this, this effectiveness data, which might be missing. As I said earlier, um, it's, it's also really about the only way that you can try to try to study how clinical effectiveness, how these patient level outcomes might vary by the level and quality of delivery. Um, and in certain fields, certainly in mental health and in some others, this, this fidelity to intervention delivery and, and the so subsequent clinical outcomes is kind of assumed and we often don't prove it. And I think that we that whenever possible, I think that we actually should try to prove those relationships. Um, <clears throat> I also think that hybrid type three three designs are more feasible and attractive when these clinical outcomes are more widely available from medical record systems uh, as opposed to um, um, having to collect those, those data um, on one's own. Um, here is my last slide. Um, here's a few more thoughts that I have on pursuing um, uh, hybrid type three designs. Um, you, don't, you don't need to use randomization in order to do these or uh, to, to, to do the type threes and in hybrid type threes and type twos, there's a number of folks now who, who are, who are uh, applying the basic principles of looking at both of these kinds of questions and in varying, you know, weights, uh, but, but not randomizing. Um, I, I, I really think it's crucial to think about whether, um, how, how much of a need there is for, collecting these 
clinical effectiveness data, the sort of patient level symptoms functioning data. Um, I think that there are some cases where that's more necessary. For example, if the intervention is being adapted um, for a certain study, either for a new population or being delivered in a new way. Um, if this intervention is being being delivered in a new context, uh, that might affect uh, uh, its effectiveness. Um, I also think that you need to contemplate what kinds of clinical effectiveness outcomes um, or what kinds of outcomes that will will be your focus. Um, are, are, are we talking about behavioral outcomes like stopping smoking, um, weight loss, um, or are we dealing, you know, maybe more with physical um, outcomes, you know, um, for example, if you're studying the uptake, you know, of a certain vaccine, you you might not need to keep looking for data showing that the vaccine once received is having an impact on disease reduction. You might, you you might not. I think every situation, every case is different, but these are the kinds of questions that you should be asking when you're trying to decide whether this is, you know, something that is going to make sense for you. I mean, I think for your for your field in general, that it might make sense for some collective thinking on what kinds of, of interventions, you know, really make sense for hybrid type threes and, and for others, maybe not, and, you know, not actually doing a hybrid, but maybe only, only doing a comparative implementation trial. Um, and lastly, I would say it's, it's, it's really important in these designs um, to try to also study mechanisms of action of these strategies. And what I mean there is trying to collect data on why these strategies work or they don't work. Why did the PDSA cycle work? Why did the audit and feedback intervention work? Why did the clinical reminder work? Um, and using theory to sort of guide that, that um, work. But it's things like, if I think I need to change attitudes about uh, of patients or about or or in providers about the intervention um, in order to um, to 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 increase the likelihood of adoption, you should try to measure those things to make sure that the strategies that you're using are having effect on these proximal outcomes which we think are linked or are mediators to these more summative outcomes of uptake and fidelity. Um, so I will stop there and I think I went about 15 minutes. Thank you so much, Dr. Curran, for your very thoughtful presentation on hybrid design. I'm sure it has triggered a lot of uh, thoughts and questions for our participants, so please don't hesitate to type them into the, the chat box um, because I will pause them afterwards. Um, and so we will hold all the questions until the end. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to our second speaker, Dr. Nathan Tumwesingwe, Chief of Party at University Research Collaboration in Uganda, so URC, for the USAID Regional Health Integration to Enhance Services Health Central Project. We call it the Har Heights Project EC. It's a five-year integrated health, HIV, and district health system strengthening project covering 11 districts of East Central Region of Uganda. Um, Dr. Nathan is the principal investigator for the Implementation Science Initiative in Uganda, and he is going to talk a little bit more about the programmatic context in which this program and initiative and research is taking place. So, Dr. Nathan, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, colleagues. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on the side of the world you are in. Um, again, my name is Nathan Tumwesije, and I'll be sharing with you a few slides on the programmatic context for the ISI work. 
on improving iron and folic acid supplementation through quite improvement uh, here in Uganda. An overview of anemia in Uganda. Um, Uganda is located in the eastern region of the continent of Africa, and in the country here, 32% of women of reproductive age are anemic, according to the survey of 2016. And we saw uh, this anemia increasing between 2011 and 2016 by about 10 percentage points. Um, the Rights EC program, the Regional Health Integration to Enhance Services in East Central uh, Uganda, Rights EC, is actually funded by USID. It's a five year program and covers 12 districts of the sub region. That's about 4.5 million people. The project goal and scope, uh, the goal is to increase access to and sustain utilization of quality health services by using a district uh, health system strengthening approach uh, of, of course, reaching out to community systems as well. Uh, the program in its entirety supports delivery of an integrated package of high impact health interventions for reproductive, maternal, newborn, child, and adolescent health, as well as nutrition, wash, HIV, and TB prevention care and treatment. So the iron and folic acid uh, uh, supplementation implementation science initiative is embedded into the broader rights EC program, uh, but focuses on anemia only. Our approaches as the broader program, uh, the following using quality improvement methods, using service delivery data to be able to pinpoint where service delivery gaps happen and then uh, putting in place corrective actions. And then of course, uh, supporting strengthening of uh, the healthcare system at district as well as facility and community level across the different blocks of the healthcare system. We also uh, spend a lot of energy on mobilizing communities to take up, utilize, and continue to utilize uh, services through uh, social behavior change uh, interventions. For the quality improvement approach, approach that we are using for this ISI work, we use uh, the national, uh, the Uganda National Quality Improvement Framework and Strategic Plan that outlines key actions. Uh, to ensure quality of clinical and non-clinical services and, of course, adhering to the national standards and guidelines uh, through building capacity for the healthcare system to be able to deliver these services. Uh, RICE EC supports healthcare facilities to initialize QI in accordance with this framework using the iterative process of uh, plan, do, study, and act uh, cycle. Uh, the, the, the usual convention, convention approach to QI. The iron and folic acid uh, supplementation work uh, looks at the following. We are looking at the intake of IFAS, iron and folic acid supplementation during pregnancy, uh, which has been proven to actually improve maternal health uh, uh, and pregnancy outcomes. Uh, we know uh, in this country that iron requirements in pregnancy are rarely met uh, by dietary food alone, and that's the need for supplementation. And here in Uganda, only 23% in our region uh, of pregnant women take more than the recommended 90 plus, a minimum of 90 tablets. Uh, that's for the country, and in the eastern region, it's 12%. So the Implementation Science Initiative aims to address the priority barriers around uptake of IFAS using existing knowledge, and then, of course, generating any additional knowledge that may be required through uh, implementation research. We conducted uh, a bottleneck assessment uh, and were able to identify three key bottlenecks that uh, affect the delivery of IFAS uh, within our healthcare system in the East Central uh, Uganda districts. We threw a, a first district level workshop and then later validation of the bottlenecks through uh, national as well as district uh, workshops that involved sector ministries, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Local Government, Office of the Prime Minister, districts as well as healthcare facilities 
were able to pick these bottlenecks and actually validate them. At service delivery level, uncoordinated health education seems to be a major problem. There seems to be a problem with uh, the supply chain for iron and folic acid. We have regular stockouts of these products at district as well as healthcare facility level. And we are also uh, surprised that actually at the, on the beneficiary side, the lack of male involvement in supporting pregnant women to seek and continue to utilize antenatal services throughout pregnancy is a major issue. And we are now looking at using a QI approach to address these uh, barriers to be able to improve uh, IFAS. Uh, previously, I've talked about the, the quality improve, improvement approach for IFAS that we are using, the PDSA uh, process, which is an iterative process uh, targeting mainly QI teams at healthcare facilities. These are the frontline service providers who do actually uh, provide the services, interact with the women and their families and children. And then small work improvement teams in different uh, MCH uh, service delivery points, especially at the ANC clinic. Uh, we use this QI approach to address the IFAS priority bottlenecks and at facility level uh, gaps in uh, health education and recurrent stockouts of uh, supplies for iron and folic acid. Uh, supplementation are the focus uh, right now. I will hand over to my colleague Moses to talk about, to dive a little deeper into what we are talking about, what we are doing, and what we are planning to do in the coming few months. Thank you so much, Dr. Nathan, for your very important presentation to understand better the context. So, so now I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Um, after hearing about hybrid design, now you understand more the context. We're going to try to share with you some of the work of trying to apply this hybrid design and do it. So I'm introducing Dr. Moses Tetri, who is a research fellow at the Department of Health Policy Planning and Management at the University of McCreary University School of Public Health and has an implementation science and system research experience that spans over eight years. He is the co-principal investigator of the implementation science uh, initiative, um, the research part in Uganda. He's also working with another researcher um, and Dr. Henry Wamani, who is not there today. So I will now hand over to Moses for the presentation. Thank you, Isabel and Jeffrey and Nathan. Uh, now I will present the third part of this uh, webinar, and I'm going to share an illustration of the effectiveness implementation hybrid design. And specifically, we will focus on the type three hybrid uh, design. As Jeff illustrated, this design gives more weight um, to the implementation research. The primary aim here be uh, testing how to do the thing. And in our case, the thing is the implementation uh, strategy that we'll be testing. The secondary aim here uh, is about gathering information on the thing. And again, in our, it involves uh, gathering um, information about, or it involves assessing the effectiveness of the implementation uh, strategy. The implementation strategy that we seek to use and investigate is an enhanced quality improvement process for iron and folic acid supplementation. This will be done through the PDS cycle that Nathan has just uh, presented. And in this, uh, in this case, uh, the cycle will be undertaken particularly to enhance IFAS interventions and during uh, antenatal care clinics. The enhanced uh, QI activities will include uh, these activities we see here on the screen, which are a bi-monthly mentorship and coaching sessions, monthly health facility performance reviews, and quality improvement uh, meetings. We will also have quarterly collaborative meetings, bi-weekly data management and reporting, iron and folic acid stock monitoring and redistribution. In addition, 
other activities will be carried out in the spirit of using the PDSA cycle. This will be more directly related to health education and the supply chain improvement activities that uh, we identified as bottlenecks in our um, bottleneck uh, assessment that Nathan also alluded to. Our implementation research seeks to test uh, the implementer strategy, which is the enhanced QI for IFAS through an already existing uh, health uh, system. And we decide to call this the uh, type three hybrid uh, design. The primary aim here uh, pays attention to the implementation processes. It will start by investigating the implementation of the enhanced QI for IFAS by focusing on IFAS related health issues given during ANC visits and the supply chain processes. To give you an idea of the outcomes and interests that we will be looking at for, we will be looking out for, uh, I share a few here. We will examine the acceptability, adoption, and visibility of the enhanced QI for IFAS. We'll also look at the health workers' competence improvements uh, for the quantification of essential uh, drugs and uh, more specifically for the quantification of IFAS in order to uh, reduce unnecessary uh, stockouts. To measure the effectiveness, which is our secondary um, uh, aim, we we'll use a quasi-experimental design. We shall therefore have a comparison arm that will allow us to examine this secondary aim. For example, um, we will look out to see, um, sorry, uh, example, we will uh, be looking out to see what proportion of pregnant women are counseled on IFAS importance and, the idea and, and their adherence during uh, ANC visits. We'll also try to see the proportion of pregnant women given the recommended number of IFAS tablets during a clinic, and the percentage of clients reporting availability of IFAS in health facilities at their last visit. It's important to note that these indicators may be indicative of some changes, but the main aim of this research is to understand how to carry out enhanced quality improvement for iron and folic acid supplementation. This is envisioned to lead to improvements in the delivery of IFAS of, of iron and folic acid supplementation within the district. Therefore, in addition to examining this effectiveness, uh, the effectiveness of, of, of the implementation strategy, we will also examine how the changes may have occurred through a detailed process documentation and evaluation. In short, therefore, the type three hybrid design allows us to evaluate effectiveness of the enhanced quality improvement for, uh, for iron and folic acid supplementation while implementing it at the same time. But this comes with some challenges and I'm just gonna uh, three here. First, our implementation strategy is not a fixed strategy because it uses the PDSA side, which is, a which is dynamic and iterative in nature. This means that the quality improvement teams in the districts, in the different cities, will carry out different activities to address the challenges that they may have identified. We will therefore have some common strategies, like I earlier on alluded to, but also differing ones across the different facilities. This can be difficult to follow through, to capture, and to document. Second, the outcomes of effectiveness that I presented are not readily available through routinely collected data at the health facility level. And neither are the process indicators that we shall need to measure how the changes happen. This means we need to have primary data collection at baseline, during the project, and at end line. This can be resource intensive and data quality 
may also be an issue and may vary. Thirdly, in nutrition, we often try to influence behaviors, and as we know, it's difficult to investigate changes of behavior. For example, regarding adherence to IFAS, when we ask women they have taken their supplements, we may have biases of recall, but also biases of social desirability. To counter some challenges, we will have or already are putting in place a comprehensive documentation process that helps us document many of these different aspects and processes that happen throughout the, process, uh, the project. This will serve as part of the, as this will serve as part of the process that we will use to explain some of the conclusions that we draw at the end of the study. Finally, I would like to share our pro uh, the progress of our uh, research uh, thus far. We undertook a bottleneck assessment and identified priority bottlenecks to focus on. And Nathan talked about this a little bit later, uh, earlier on. And we chose to focus through a robust process that involved different stakeholders to focus on health education and drug quantification processes in order to improve the uptake of IFAS. We have also done a baseline evaluation of the standard quality improvement processes in the, in the uh, districts that we'll be working in. And this is important for us to articulate the enhanced uh, quali um, quality improvement for IFAS that will happen in the intervention districts while the standard uh, will happen in the comparison district. And lastly, we have also evaluated the health education and essential drug quantification status at baseline. This will be useful in, me in the measuring of the effectiveness of our strategy at end line. But we will use exactly the same indicators to see if there's been any difference uh, uh, that has occurred uh, and, and, how, and how we will be able to, and how much of this we can attribute to our intervention or our intervention or implementation strategy. And these are gonna be our next steps. We will orient our QI teams on the enhanced uh, quality improvement for IFAS. Then together with frontline health, we shall prioritize areas for improvement and initiation of the QI projects. And lastly, we will continue to do the process documentation and evaluation. This ends my presentation, and I want to thank you for your attention. And now we're going to move to a question and answer session uh, period. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Moses. I want to thank you also, all our presenters. Um, I, now it's time to hear about from the audience. Now you can ask as many questions as I would like, and I know some questions are entering, so I'm going to accumulate them. I'd like to first pose the first questions to Dr. Curran, um, because um, um, I know probably many people here are not familiar with the hybrid design. Um, for us, just preparing this webinar has been very stimulating. Um, also trying to understand some part because we don't know of other um, hybrid design that has been done and labeled as such um, in the field of nutrition. So um, I'd like to ask you, Dr. Kieran, for people who have never done a hybrid design, what advice would you give um, people to get started in, in jump into this okay sure um so i would say that um there's a there's a new paper out now um um by landis at all sarah landis um which you know goes into a little more detail um about you know some of the questions that one could you know ask oneself about, you know, about, you know, where to start. We are currently doing a review of 120 plus uh, published hybrid designs, you know, trying to, to get a sense of how 
these are being used. And, you know, in this next year, we will be writing up those summary papers with some new recommendations. I have created um, a sort of flow document, um, which will be in these new papers and actually, which I'm giving a, a talk on at this conference later on today. And I can send it to you actually to share with your group. Um, it's a series of questions, um, which, um, based upon the answers can lead you to, Hey, I think that your best bet is a hybrid one in this case, a hybrid two, a hybrid three or, or a, or a non-hybrid. And the crucial decision points have to do with things like the quality of evidence on the clinical or preventive intervention that you want to explore, um, the extent of your knowledge of the implementation challenges of that intervention in your, your context of interest, your knowledge about the types of strategies, if any, that have been already tried to, to support uptake of some intervention. Um, <clears throat> and then um, how much that you know about those barriers uh, to, up, to, to uptake um, uh, upon which to base a new strategy or new strategy package, which you might want to then test. So there's, you know, many decision points and, you know, many data elements which drive the selection of what kind of hybrid might work best or if you actually need one. And, you know, from this study that we just heard, I mean, it was really wonderful to, you know, hear a number of these steps covered, you know, sort of some, you know, some known, some known data on the, um, implementation gap, doing a bottleneck analysis to lead to barriers and then trying to match implementation strategies to address those using what is often called an, an implementation strategy as usual, kind of what normally happens as the comparison condition, um, which is compared to um, and, and, you know, a, 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 a different strategy bundle, which, you know, might give some of the same elements in a higher dose and or some new strategies, both of which is happening here. Um, so um, those are some of the questions that, you know, um, you need to consider when trying to decide if you actually, you know, should explore a hybrid design and if so which 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 uh type excellent thank you so much i'm sure um uh, many people would be interested by by the paper as well and so um i will move into an, another questions now maybe for moses um someone wanted to hear a little bit more in terms of the iron folic acid tablets and packaging in in us uh, in in uganda that is used and how is it procured? How does the supply chain reach the hell post? I think there were questions about the stock out. So um, Moses and, and um, Anuri Mamani just finished a baseline um, just to understand better um, the procurement system, but also the health education. So maybe Moses can answer some of these questions or provide some insight about uh, what were some challenges that were found for the, the procurement and the stock out. Um, Moses, it's yours now. Okay, thank you. So um, in Uganda, uh, most of the uh, drugs and supplies for public facilities are procured uh, through the centralized system from the national medical stores. And uh, there is a process that is uh, similar across all the, the districts, there are guidelines on this. So when we did the uh, baseline, it was pretty much the same, the guidelines on how to procure 
uh, for certain uh, facilities, uh, for different levels of facilities. And uh, also at uh, uh, district level, different kinds of facilities. So these are pretty much uh, standard. And uh, But what we found was the main challenge is at certain levels of facilities, usually lower facilities, there is not uh, enough uh, capacity or there isn't uh, capacity or even people that are designated to, uh, um, to take care of uh, supplies and uh, drug confiscation and so on. So sometimes uh, certain health workers uh, um, assign those roles in addition to their roles. But in, in reality, they, according to the protocol, they, we should have, let's say, um, a dispenser or um, at a high level, let's say, hospital, we should have a pharmacist. Um, so, uh, so th th those are the challenges. So, the, the how people do this then become varies from uh, one facility to another, and therefore the need to try and uh, improve the capacity of the facilities to be able to accurately identify um, the, 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 their their need and also monitor the the, the stockouts. But the, the the infrastructure and uh, procedures and guidelines are in place. I mean, there is a process for uh, requisitioning and process for dispensing and storage and so on. That's all uh, in place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Moses. Um, and so I have another question that I'd like to pose to Dr. Nathan, and that is related more to the QHI Enhance IFAS. And so the question is, have you figured out a way to assess effect of the QI Enhance IFAS on the other component of ANC? In fact, the question is more like, does the focus on IFAS potentially have a negative effect on the other aspect of ANC? So, Dr. Nathan, if you may want to talk a little bit, because I know um, the project coordinator for the Implementation Science Initiative has visited with a team all um, health facilities to initiate also the, the interventions. And, um, we have found that the, the, the QI um, approach that was taking place needed some enhancement. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about uh, what is going to take place and, and how this may affect negatively or even positively, I would say, um, this focus on IFAS for the QI. Thank you for the question. Uh, it's actually likely to positively impact the general QI within the NC setting. Um, in the rest of the broader program for rights EC, we have uh, the QI approach, but also QI interventions taking place, but not as frequently as uh, we are planning for this enhanced work. So for all facilities, they receive at least, and we are talking about 531 healthcare facilities, different levels, they receive uh, at least quarterly QI coaching and mentorship. But for this uh, IFAS work, we are going to, for the selected districts and facilities, we are going to do the enhanced approach where the frequency and the depth of the QI coaching and mentorships are going to be enhanced. And these are within the ANC platform uh, generally. So the, we expect that uh, the ANC platform is going to gain from these frequent QI interactions with the system other than suffering because of uh, iron and folic acid. So, and that's what Moses talked about earlier, that different sites are going to likely to do different QI things. And that's one of the challenges, how we are going to be able to tease out, you know, exactly what we are going to analyze. Because once the team is set out, they just look at their own service delivery system and assess where the gaps are versus where the, versus the standards and what they are expected to be doing. Definitely iron and folic acid is going to be one of them. Of course, it's going to be more or less biased. But then they will look at other service delivery processes within ANC, and they can't leave those gaps hanging. Once they prioritize them, it's up to the team to actually uh, say, these are our priorities to address in this period of time. So we expect this to have an additive advantage. 
Thank, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Uh, doing the PDSA cycle may seem straightforward, but as, as much as the health provider builds some skills, I think it, it may just also be helpful in other areas. So thank you. Your questions are entering. So here is a, a, a one for, I think, Dr. Curran. Um, someone uh, say here, can we conduct a hybrid two or three evaluation of a traditional RCT? And the question is, I did not consider a hybrid design during initial 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 design and implementation of a pilot study. However, I would like to evaluate implementation outcomes. Can I conduct a hybrid post-hoc? Um, so um, I would say that there are many people who are, who are applying these hybrid design principles in smaller studies and pilot studies and in non-randomized designs. Um, Actually, there's a very common variant of a type 2 where um, there is a patient-level randomized trial of some intervention, of, of some clinical intervention, nested in a pilot study of a single uptake strategy or single package of strategies that all of the places get. So it's not comparing two, two different strategies, but only using one in, in the context of, or as a supportive context of delivering the intervention for the clinical trial, which is still the focus. So, you know, it's sort of a hybrid 1.5 or a 1.8 or a certain variation of, of, of a hybrid type two. The, the, the key point here to, to make it a hybrid type two is that the, imp, the implementation strategy or strategies that are, that are being used in that have to be hypothesized to be um, potentially useful in the real world. Um, in hybrid type ones and even just regular clinical effectiveness trials, there's a number of uptake strategies that are used to deliver the intervention during that clinical trial. We often just don't call them implementation strategies, and many of them are not feasible in the real world. You know, paying interventionists to deliver it, paying people to be part of the study, um, you know, lots of things like that, which just don't really work in the real world, usually for real world delivery of these interventions. Um, I would say, um, you know, uh, uh, for the first part of the question, our paper, you know, had all of these designs couched in a trial mindset that there's some sort of random uh, randomization happening either at the patient level, more in hybrid type one, at the provider clinic system location level for a hybrid type three or as a possibility in some hybrid type tools, twos, dual level or you know dual randomization at both the patient or provider system level. Um, you know that's how we initially wrote it, um, and you know that is happening too. Frankly, we are seeing now some hybrid type one designs where people are kind of moving back. In the, um, in the pipeline and actually doing a hybrid type one design with uh, during small efficacy trials. So, you know, highly controlled trials of, of some medication or of, or of some intervention. Having some associated process evaluation to try to understand better, um, you know, what some of the potential future bottlenecks might be might be barriers might be should this intervention prove efficacious and then next <coughs> sorry effective um, thank you that that's very helpful and, and if i can add something i feel like um dr Trahan has been um has written this paper from 2012 that really presents um, and articulate the hybrid design, but people have done it before. So they were with this group of researchers, they were the one who really coined the term and put all the things together. Um, and, and so I, I, I just recently, I read a paper on colorectal, 
colorectal cancer, where they went back to some studies that they had done and tried to see how the hybrid design was maybe done with, without uh, um, having this explicitly done before. So I think that's also... Oh, yeah. That yeah, developed. absolutely. That is very, very common. And in our search, you know, when we're trying to do this review of, of hybrid designs, we are, you know, talking about some where they never used the language. You know, other other people were doing these kinds of blends before, but just not calling it that. And our paper in 2012 was trying to bring some additional structure to these designs, recommendations for how to move forward, rationale that you should use to select one over the other or or none of them. Um, and in in, in the years since, with some new papers, we've tried to add more, you know, more of those recommendations, greater specification, and there's more coming. Mm -hmm. So, so I think that's very insightful when we read your paper and, and try just to put some vocabulary, but because also that's a challenge. So, so thank you for yes, that. Yes. One, one question here, um, and because I mentioned like we don't have a lot of hybrid design that are explicit in, in nutrition, and someone is asking, how is hybrid design different from a process evaluation plus an impact evaluation combination that have been carried out to test effectiveness of several nutrition program? And so we're, the, the person is giving, for example, how Ivan Tribe has done uh, this, and, and so I wonder if you have some thought, Dr. Turan, on this. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think that, I mean, especially, you know, in the hybrid type one arena, you know, I think that there have been a number of people who have done clinical effectiveness trials with a process evaluation. Um, you know, most of them do that because they have to have an understanding of the process during the trial because they have to ensure that they're delivering the intervention correctly or else you don't have a good good clinical effectiveness trial so most of all of those studies do some level of process evaluation the hybrid designs um try to add certain kinds of questions to be added to a a process evaluation that is more directed at what future uptake might be and what are the barriers to future uptake in the real world and what can we learn from what what the process was in the trial to help us to look forward and part of that work is adding is you know using implementation frameworks to ask different kinds of questions about future uptake problems and future strategies that might be needed that are not available or have even been developed now. Um, so it's similar in thought and in and in process. The the content of the process evaluation is usually different um, and more focused on future uptake and trying to lay the groundwork for for the development and future testing of implementation strategies that we think need to happen to have this work in the real world under non-study conditions as opposed to these more study-driven, top-down, um, randomized control trials. Um, that's great. That's very uh, helpful. So, so I think it's going to be the last question that I took because uh, at the same time, the time is, is over. I'm sure many of you have would have taken much more. Um, it's, it's been very stimulating or even preparing for that. So I hope that this webinar, you found it informative and thought-provoking. I cannot thank enough all of our speakers for doing this. If you have any questions or ideas for up, upcoming webinars, you can always contact us and we will be um, happy to take these. Um, I'm sharing also that we'll have another webinar in January 2020 on another mod, mod methodology that will be the focus ethnographic study. Um, do visit our website to stay up to date on the society's activities and learn more about implementation science and nutrition and various engagement opportunities. Kristen is also active on social media and we welcome your thoughts and comments for engaging uh, even more. 
Once you leave the, today's webinar, you will receive a very brief survey on the webinar. And I would appreciate if you could take just a moment to provide your feedback. That's always very important. You will also receive a follow-up email in a few weeks with a link to today's webinar recording um, and a PDF of the slides. So on behalf of the citizens and our presenters and our collaborators, I thank you so much for joining us today. And I, I wish you a great, great rest of the day. Thank you very much, everyone.